For centuries, the devil has been the laughing stock of Christians. We've boiled him down to a mindless, raging being, creating chaos just for the sake of chaos. But have we ever considered Satan as an actual character in the biblical story? A character with actual emotions, realistic motivations, and specific goals. A character who does nothing by accident and thinks through his every move. A character who had a real chance at changing the direction of human history forever. Have we ever asked the question, why did Satan really rebel from God? Why does he hate humanity so much? And what was his unique connection to Jesus? I mean, all the strongest villains in our favourite movies have goals and morals they believe to be right. So why would the ultimate villain be evil just for the sake of evil? And what does the Bible actually say about Satan? Throughout the whole Bible, we encounter glimpses of Satan's personality, fragments that hint at a more complex motivation. By putting all the pieces together, we get convincing answers to these tough questions revealing a character with far more understandable objectives. The story I'm about to tell you deepens the entire biblical narrative, including all the major characters, and it starts in a time before humans. Many eons ago, God created a heavenly species, glorious angelic beings who worship around the throne of their creator. But among the worshipers, God anointed one for a special purpose. Described as a signet of perfection and blameless in his ways, he was covered with many precious gemstones and was exalted to a special place in heaven. God himself chose this angel to be a guardian cherub, a morning star shining bright in all his splendor in the full presence of God. His name was Lucifer, meaning bearer of light. Despite his high position, he believed he was deserving of more. He wanted to exalt himself above his angelic brethren and become like the Most High. Although ambitious, Lucifer served his creator blamelessly until God made a decision that would change everything. He decided to create again. The angels marveled at God's creation of light and of the stars. They sang praises as he created plant life and the land in which it would grow. They rejoiced as they watched him form the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky. Everything he created was good. But on the sixth day, God made his most controversial decision, creating mankind. At this point, God says to himself a phrase that Lucifer never expected he would hear. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. This creation was special, uniquely loved and appreciated by God, and yet they seemed so feeble and vulnerable. What exactly made this creation so special? Well, Lucifer was soon to find out because God had a vision. A plan that would cause Lucifer to question everything. A plan to crown this pathetic little race of creatures with glory and honor. To bring them near to God. To establish them as God's own possession. To receive new, perfect bodies. To become heirs to his kingdom. To inherit eternal life, spiritual rewards, and dominion in heaven and most critically, a plan in which they would become like the Most High. There was abundant rejoicing at the creation of the world in heaven, but Lucifer felt a growing resentment towards God's new love. Why would God create an entirely new species to worship when Lucifer and the angels had been doing it perfectly their entire lives? But to Lucifer's growing unease, there was even more to God's exaltation of humanity. He planned on giving the world to come, not to the angels, but to the humans. He planned to send the angels to the humans as servants. And ultimately, his new species would have authority to judge Lucifer and his brethren. 
God's ultimate creation wasn't the angels after all. It was these pathetic little animals. Lucifer was an angel brimming with confidence. He assumed that if God were to bless his creation, he would be the first. To him, angels were the supreme beings, and described as the morning star, he was the cream of the crop. He adored himself, and having humanity elevated above him was incredibly unfair. This is when Lucifer came up with a plan. A plan to prove to God and the angels that God was making a mistake. Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, and Lucifer identified weaknesses that could be exploited. The tree of knowledge of good and evil gave him an opportunity to strike. And with a simple question and a simple lie, Lucifer had successfully triggered the fall of humanity. He demonstrated to all the heavenly hosts and God himself just how easy it was to lead these creatures astray. This was the first step in Lucifer's vengeful vision. His objective was simple, to prove that the human race was incapable of fulfilling God's perfect design for them, to prove that humans weren't worthy of inheriting eternal life or inheriting God's creation, and ultimately, to get God to annihilate humanity and bless the angels instead. After the fall of man, God found wickedness in the heart of Lucifer, and he was cast out from heaven. He lost his status and his wisdom was corrupted, but he wasn't alone. Because God was so intent on exalting humanity, and Lucifer had just proven how easily they were deceived, many of his angelic brothers abandoned their heavenly posts as well and joined the rebellion. At that time, a third of the angels were convinced and deserted their creator. This is the moment when Lucifer, the guardian cherub, died. And Satan, the adversary of mankind, was born. With this new name came a new role. He would accuse mankind day and night, accusing them of sinning and failing to live up to the image of God. Satan knew that if humanity were to succumb to sin, God's justice would guarantee their destruction, proving that the blessing should have remained with the angels all along, and ultimately, that Satan was right. But at the fall of mankind, God had an unexpected response. Once Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, they became sinners before God. They were ashamed of their nakedness and decided to run away and hide. But instead of destroying them for their betrayal, God sought them out. He created clothing to cover them and performed the first sacrifice. At humanity's lowest moment, God stood by their side. But Satan now had an effective argument to level against God. God's justice had been compromised in his gracious response to humanity's rebellion. And eventually, he would have to destroy them. The damage was done. Satan would embody his dual title as tempter and accuser, tempting the offspring of Eve to sin and accusing them of being failures when they did. This was his life's work, to ensure not a single human could live up to God's glorious design. And Satan's successful sabotage continued on and on throughout the generations. God saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. God regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So he flooded the world, killing every single human. Satan had achieved the first part of his objective, but God's mercy got in the way. Yet again, God had shown undeserved mercy to humanity, and yet again, he relented from executing his justice by rightfully destroying them. Satan knew that if he kept up the efforts, someday soon God would have to annihilate humanity. Until a certain man named Job offered a glimpse of hope for all of mankind. About 400 years after the global flood, all the angels came to present themselves before God, and Satan was among them. 
The angels listened in anticipation as God and Satan made a wager of cosmic significance. You see, before this conversation, Satan was roaming the earth, tempting the offspring of Eve to sin and accusing them of being failures. But there arose one man who Satan seemed to be ignoring. His name was Job, a man who was blameless and upright. Known as the greatest man of the East, Job would regularly sacrifice offerings just in case any of his children cursed God in their hearts. He was a man who truly sought to live a righteous life, a man who seemed to be upholding God's image better than many before him. But Satan disputed the heart behind Job's righteousness. He was convinced that Job's faith was in the blessings God had given him rather than in God himself. He stated that if God were to remove the blessings from Job, he would surely curse him to his face. God, willing to test his faith, agreed, and from that moment, Job fell into the hands of the devil. All his material possessions were destroyed, and all of his family and servants, except for his wife, were killed in tragic circumstances. But instead of running from God or cursing him like his ancestors, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. But there was one more thing Satan had yet to do. One last trick up his sleeve. The angels gathered once more in God's presence, and God questioned Satan once more. He reminded Satan that his efforts against Job had proven fruitless. This wasn't good for Satan, because if this human could resist his allure, he would be forced to admit that God was right and would be made a fool of before all of the heavenly hosts. So he snapped back at God and challenged his mercy again. Strike his flesh and bones, he said. Surely then he will curse you to your face. God once again agreed, but made it clear that Satan wasn't to take Job's life in the process. Job was covered from head to toe in blistering sores. His situation got worse and worse, but through it all, Job never cursed his Lord. For the first time in human record, one of Satan's accusations fell flat. His promise that Job would blaspheme God hadn't come to pass. And as a reward for his endurance, Job was exalted twice as high as he was when it all began. Through the faithfulness of Job, humanity had achieved their first minor victory, dealing Satan a small but shameful defeat. But things weren't all hopeful for mankind. Though he didn't curse God, Job still had to repent for some of his conduct. He fell short and was still undeserving of God's mercy. Before a holy God, he was still covered in filthy rags. It was clear to the heavenly hosts, and especially clear to Satan, that humans had a hard time living up to their image-bearing status. Mankind was still lost, fumbling around in the dark, piecing together their own idea of what it means to obey God and reflect his image. So God revealed something to man that would help restore their relationship and something that the devil would quickly take advantage of. Around 640 years after Job, a man named Moses was given the law by God himself, a system in which people could atone for their sins by sacrificing an animal in their place. God had offered a temporary solution to the problem of man's evil that Satan had highlighted time and time again. But it was just that, temporary. Satan knew the offering of bulls and goats was incapable of truly satisfying God's wrath and cleansing the people of sin. He knew that the millions of animals that were slaughtered every year in God's name could never validate mankind as a race. He knew that God didn't even desire the sacrifices of animals. In light of this, Satan took advantage of the new law given by God to his people and saw great success in tempting many to disobey him. Because the law illuminated the difference between good and evil, Satan knew exactly what God was pleased with and what he disapproved of. This made his job far easier, causing generations of kings to be led astray by foreign wives, unclean activities, and their own selfish pride. 
Once again, it seemed God's solution to mankind's problem had only served to strengthen the devil's arguments. As long as humans continued to sin, they were deserving of death. The Lord looked down from heaven on the children of man to see if there were any who understood, who sought after God, but they had all turned aside. Every one of them wandered the earth with filthy clothes. No one was righteous, not even one. More than 1,000 years after the law was instituted, a prophet named Zechariah saw something incredibly interesting. Despite playing a minor role among the prophets of old, Zechariah was one of the few humans who met one of history's most mysterious characters, a being who had appeared in glimpses to Zechariah's ancestors, a being who would play a critical role in the upcoming events, and a being who would spell disaster for Satan's accusations. A man named Joshua served as high priest at the time of Zechariah's vision. Due to their exclusive passage to God, the high priest had to follow stringent purity laws and was often considered the most holy among men. Yet Zechariah's vision opened with Joshua standing before his men and the being dressed in filthy rags. Satan appeared and started accusing Joshua before God and the being. This is the greatest among them? Even the holiest of humans is covered in filth and mud. What chance do they have in God's presence? Why don't you just destroy them already? God had heard enough. The being before Joshua rebuked the devil and silenced him. He then turned to Joshua and said to those nearby, take off his filthy clothes. Satan listened in utter disbelief as the being said the following words to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. But it can't be so. He's done nothing to deserve to be cleansed. If anything, he should be destroyed. But the being ignoring Satan's accusations said to them, you are men symbolic of things to come. The Lord Almighty says, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Satan listened, baffled by the promise that was spoken, a promise that would erase all of his tireless work, all of his accusations and all of his authority in a single day. But how is this even possible? And who is this being saying these things? The being that spoke to Joshua was known as the Angel of the Lord. For the next 500 years after Zechariah's vision, God seemed to take a back seat. From Satan's eyes, it seemed like God had run out of ideas to redeem humanity. He'd implemented animal sacrifice. He'd instituted a law to make man clean. He even purged a great number of them and started again. But none of these solutions could redeem mankind. According to God's justice, humanity should have been entirely exterminated eons ago. But according to God's mercy, humanity continued to live and multiply in their sinful state. Soon enough, God would have to decide. He couldn't claim both justice and mercy. He would have to choose one. While enjoying a period of victory, Satan couldn't help but feel anxious. The vision of Zechariah haunted him. The being promised to erase the sin of the whole land in a single day. Could it really be possible? God's word had been recorded by prophets and kings. And while studying the scriptures, Satan hunted for clues to help him prepare for God's redemptive plan. He refused to let anyone or anything erase all of his hard work in a single day. The thought of it terrified him. One night, a glimmering star appeared above a town called Bethlehem. A young mother named Mary gave birth to her firstborn child in a stable. God's plan started to take shape in Satan's mind. He wanted to redeem humanity by becoming a human himself. But it seemed too easy. 
It was as if God had given Satan the blueprint for his plan in the scriptures. He was playing with an open hand. Satan once again took initiative and moved promptly. He ordered the death of every boy under the age of two through King Herod, hoping to swiftly deal with this rising threat. But the boy escaped with his family to Egypt, and from Egypt, moved to Nazareth. Satan had been outsmarted by God. Not only did he fail to kill Jesus as a baby, he contributed to something much, much worse. In his pursuit of the child, he actually fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy, helping to confirm the boy's identity as Messiah. God's ultimate plan to redeem humanity had finally arrived, and Satan had already failed to stop it. The race against time had officially begun, but the devil, well versed in Old Testament scripture, still had some ideas he believed could bring God's plan to a catastrophic end. As time went on, the boy from Nazareth grew in strength and was filled with wisdom. Satan observed his greatest rival and worst enemy grow up before him like a tender shoot. There was nothing about him that made him stand out, no beauty or majesty. But to Satan, this humble carpenter was his ultimate fixation. While Satan prepared his next attack, God was already making his next move. Jesus was baptized by a prophet named John in the wilderness before a great crowd of people. As he resurfaced from the flowing river, the spirit came upon him from heaven and God himself confirmed to all those listening that this was in fact his son. God had publicly announced his arrival as man on earth. He was finally here and his public ministry was about to begin. Satan didn't know what the mission entailed and he didn't know what God had in store, but he knew one thing. If God had any hope of redeeming humanity, this human form would be essential to the plan's success. So Satan set out to derail God's plan by using the strongest weapon in his arsenal, temptation. But Satan didn't catch God off guard with this move. This was actually something they agreed upon. Like the debate they had over Job, Satan and God met again to settle things once and for all. Finally, Satan had a chance to go up against God himself in a form that he was confident he could tarnish. So God led Jesus into the wilderness by the spirit and there he met the accuser for a face-off that would change everything. Because the father and son were one, Satan's goal was simple, separate them. If he could trick Jesus into obeying him instead of God, he would be successful in separating the father and son, causing the son to sin and ultimately invalidating humanity for good. He figured that if God in human form couldn't remain sinless, then the last hope for mankind would be snuffed out. But he needed something to wager, something that Jesus would actually consider doing. In his first temptation, Satan challenged Jesus to turn stones into bread, a simple but powerful test, considering Jesus had just gone 40 days without food. The devil targeted the lust of his flesh. Being fully man, Satan knew that Jesus was desperate to eat just like any other man in that condition. But in spite of his raging hunger, he answered the devil with scripture about God's providence. But Satan's next temptation was more cunning than the last. This time he took Jesus to the highest point of the temple and challenged him to jump, quoting a promise from God that the Messiah wouldn't suffer harm from a fall. Satan employed a tactic from the days of Eden, where he would deceive his target into believing God might not be so trustworthy. If Jesus were to jump, he would show that the relationship between them wasn't one of complete trust. But Jesus answered the devil with scripture of his own, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan had suffered two defeats so far, so for his final temptation, he had no choice but to wager everything at his disposal. He took Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Kingdoms he had held captive in sin for thousands of years. A world under his control. A world which was his to offer. 
In exchange, the Son of God was asked to bow down and worship the devil in return. Jesus paused. He knew that someday all the kingdoms of the world would be his, that he would be made king over them all. He had no doubt in God's promise of that, but he reflected on what it would take to get there. If he listened to the devil and conceded, he could inherit the world without undergoing the torturous future to come. If he'd simply bow down to Satan, all of his suffering would be finished. But at the same rate, if God bowed down before Satan, he would be admitting that no human was deserving, that the blessing all those eons ago was misplaced, and ultimately that Satan was right. But Jesus, strengthened by the Spirit, rebuked the devil, exclaiming that there is only one name worthy of worship, God the Creator. With his powerful words, Jesus sent Satan away and was tended to by angels. Satan's attempt at the Son of Man had returned fruitless. Despite his terrible condition, Jesus remained faithful throughout the temptation and did not sin. Witnessing Jesus' faith, Satan writhed as he relived the agony of Job's victory all over again. But this time, the stakes were much, much higher. So he changed tact and waited for another opportunity. It seemed Satan's king had been dethroned, but his strongest piece, his secret weapon, was quietly sitting in the back, waiting for permission to make a move. For the next three years, Jesus went throughout the land undoing all of Satan's hard work. He healed those suffering in sickness. He raised people from the dead, and he expelled many of Satan's demonic kin from their hosts. At his sight, the demons quaked in fear and begged not to be destroyed by him. Every exorcism was a torturous reunion between a rebellious angel and his all-powerful creator. But Satan pondered, what was the point of all this? Why had the all-powerful God, creator of the earth, subjected himself within its confides? By clothing himself in human flesh, the limitless had limited himself. Shackled by hunger, bound by space and time, and subject to exhaustion, he seemed intent on living out the authentic human experience without taking any shortcuts. It wasn't until Satan overheard Jesus speaking to his disciples about his mission on earth that the picture became a little more clear. While the disciples ignorantly dismissed the outrageous plan Jesus shared, the devil adapted his plans accordingly. God was enacting a strategy, a way to fulfill the threat of Zachariah's vision and undermine all of Satan's accusations. But the secret to his plan wasn't in a single nation or a single people. It was in a single man and a single sacrifice. Despite humanity's pitiful weakness, God was proving that this man could achieve something that none before him came close to achieving, perfection. After living the perfect life, the man would be bound to the altar as the perfect lamb, a sinless sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Satan realized that if Jesus somehow managed to carry out this mission successfully, humanity would be permanently redeemed, freed from his accusations and worthy to receive the blessings God had denied Satan in the beginning. God's justice would finally be satisfied in the slaying of his son, allowing his mercy to abound freely upon those undeserving wretches. Satan had to move, and fast. So he spoke with God one final time. Have you considered my son Jesus? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright. Have you not protected him all these years? From his birth, through his childhood, and even during his ministry, you've put a wall of safety around him. Remove your hand of protection, and let's see whether he can endure what is to come. Just like every human before him, he will ultimately let you down. Very well, God answered. The wager was on again, but with one major difference. 
This time, the fate of all humanity hung in the balance. God would show before all the powers and principalities that humans deserved his blessing. Or, Satan would prove before all the heavenly hosts that he deserved this misplaced honor. The stakes were higher than ever. Both parties' objectives hinged on whether Jesus could do the impossible. The devil got an idea. If he could at any point get the Messiah to stumble into sin, his perfect sacrifice would be invalidated, and the final hope of redeeming humanity would be lost. If God in human form couldn't prove himself worthy of the blessing, then no other hope for these creatures remained, leaving Satan to experience a resurrection of status. At this point, Satan knew the cross was unavoidable. So instead of evading it, he embraced it as an opportunity to sabotage Jesus before God. Satan devised a scheme to make use of every human at his disposal. He had many pieces to move. God had only one. Satan had to find a way to make Jesus sin before he escaped to the grave, ensuring any hope of humanity died with him. Jesus had put up a firm resistance in the wilderness, so Satan knew what he was up against. He would have to attack from every angle, humiliate and torture him, strip him of all comfort to make it impossible for Jesus to remain perfect. While sharing his final meal with his beloved disciples, Satan entered into one of Jesus' companions to turn Jesus over to the chief priests. But before it even happened, Jesus announced this betrayal at the dinner table. He seemed prepared, but Satan would not be unnerved, because the torture had only just begun. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ was overwhelmed with emotion. Knowing he'd just been handed over to the devil, he begged God to find another way to redeem humanity. But deep down he knew, he was the final piece, the King of Kings. The future of mankind would be determined in the next 15 hours, and it rested solely on Jesus' shoulders. And with a simple kiss, Satan triggered the final temptation of Jesus. For the next 15 hours, he would be subject to a level of suffering never before experienced by man. Unfathomable agony on the physical, emotional, and spiritual level. These events would be later known as the Passion of Christ. Christ was arrested and taken to an illegal trial. His disciples scattered out of fear, and his best friend denied him three times. After a corrupt ordeal involving false witnesses and many deceptions, Jesus was convicted and sentenced to crucifixion. He was flogged and whipped, mocked and scorned. They dressed him in a purple robe, and twisted together a crown of thorns, forcing it into his head. They took turns punching him, spitting on him and tearing out his beard. He was tossed into the open, where his own people formed a crowd encircling him. The leaders of the people choosing to worship their enemy's king. They hated Rome, but they hated God more. Jesus looked upon the very people he was there to redeem with sadness as they spat mocked and ridiculed their only redemptive hope. He carried his own cross to the mount where he was hung. Nails were driven into his hands and feet, pinning him to the wood and forcing his lacerated back to drag up and down the plank as he tried to grasp his next breath. While Satan was doing his worst, the earth cried out in agony as its maker was being slain. The sky became dark and the ground shook, but Satan refused to relent. He was so close to death, and yet Jesus hadn't opened his mouth against the Lord. Satan panicked. He started insulting the Son of Man, echoing his challenge in the wilderness. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us! Satan was exposing humans in all the depraved wickedness, 
before the God who had come to save them. And finally, Jesus opened his mouth. While bearing all the sin of mankind in his flesh, he gazed up to heaven, and seeing only darkness, he muttered, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was that it? Was all the pain and suffering too much to bear? Did he finally turn away from God and curse him in his last moments? Did Jesus die in sin like the rest of mankind? Had Satan just won? After Jesus had breathed his last, Satan waited for the confirmation of his victory. He expected that if Jesus did maintain his sinlessness after the onslaught of suffering, he would rise again as he promised. Seconds turned to minutes, minutes turned to hours, hours turned to days. Every second that passed gave Satan more confidence that Christ wasn't coming back. All factors seemed to point to a victory for Satan. Scattered disciples, widespread chaos, and a wounded planet. But on the third day, Satan trembled. The stone barring the tomb had been rolled away, and the body of his nemesis had vanished. On the third day, the reality of Jesus' victory over death hit him all at once, confirmed by his resurrection. On the third day, the deceiver of the nations discovered that he was the one who'd been deceived. He'd been deployed by the Father to carry his son through the tortures that would redeem humanity, ensuring every prophecy was fulfilled and all the conditions were met to grant humanity the glory they never deserved. A deep resentment bubbled within Satan, a hatred unknown to mortal men, a loathing that had been brewing for eons ready to burst forth in unprecedented outrage. Jesus had burdened himself with the sins of every human, taking them onto his own sinless body and removing them via his death and resurrection. For the first time ever, humanity was worthy to receive the blessings promised to them. And most importantly, humanity was permanently freed from Satan's powerful accusations. No longer did Satan have the platform to accuse man before God. As far as God was concerned, Satan had no evidence that a redeemed believer was deserving of judgment. But Satan, desperately looking for a loophole, quickly identified something to exploit. Under this new covenant of grace, Whoever believed in the Son would have eternal life, but whoever didn't would still perish. Satan realized that though Christ offered the gift of grace to all sinners, not all sinners would accept that gift. And if a sinner chose to remain in their sin, they'd be spitting in the face of their all-loving Creator and choosing their own condemnation. This was an outcome Satan desperately desired. And with the rapid growth of Christianity taking over, Satan had to act quickly. So he started to prowl, scouring the earth for weakness and preying upon them. He abandoned the name Accuser, for that power had been vanquished, and adopted the new title of Devourer. Satan saw some success in deceiving and devouring many over the following centuries. But those who believed in Jesus seemed to have other plans. They started gathering together for times of worship and encouragement. They called it church, and they started calling themselves Christians. Satan identified this fellowship as a threat. Though the early church was powerful in denying his attempts to creep in, its resistance faltered as time progressed. Satan secured quite an influential foothold in many congregations, 
deceiving people and luring them back outside to the dark world of sin and death. But he found that there were always some who resisted him. It was as if they had been protected by God himself from Satan's attacks. These new saints seem to be equipped with some special armour, granting them immunity to the devil's intrusions. The group was called the Elect, and Satan realised he was powerless against them. Their stalwart defence frustrated Satan to no end. Satan's dominion over people was now challenged by these pockets of resistance, granted immunity by the sacrifice of Jesus. A sacrifice that Satan partially enabled. He needed something bigger. It was obvious their strength came through Jesus' power, so Satan adapted his plans accordingly. But how could he possibly contend with the risen Saviour in ascended form backed by the Father and Spirit? It was three against one. Coordinating mankind into a force against them was an important and insulting step. But that army alone wouldn't stand a chance against the Holy Trinity. Satan needed a trinity of his own. Satan continued working evil amongst humanity, priming them for the day of battle against their Lord and Saviour. When the time had come and the pieces had fallen into place, Satan stood on the seashore, anticipating the climax of his plan to arrive. A powerful beast burst through the calm waters. It boasted seven heads with ten intimidating horns. One of the heads had a fatal wound, which had been healed. The wound stood in mockery of the wounds left in Christ's body from the cross. And so the beast joined Satan in his army against God. Satan granted the beast authority over his kingdom on earth hoping the beast would use his pervasive charisma and deceptive charm to lure even the elect away from Jesus. If the elect could be led astray, Satan could crush the pockets of resistance within his empire of darkness and effectively mobilize all of humanity against their creator. The beast was known as the man of lawlessness, son of destruction, and was given the title of Antichrist. The Antichrist, backed by Satan, saw great success in deceiving the human race. The great beast received worship from the enslaved, and so did Satan. The devil had typically lurked in the shadows before now, deceptively luring people into following him. Openly being worshipped, on a global scale, was an unfamiliar sensation he could certainly get used to. Satan's pride was drained by Christ, but it was recharged by the worship he received that should have been God's. But Satan's unholy trinity was not yet complete. He was still awaiting its final member. The earth burst open as a second beast emerged. This beast had two large horns and spoke like a dragon. Completing the trio, the third beast adopted a special role. The authority of the first beast was shared with the second, reinforced by the signs and wonders it performed. Like the prophet Elijah, it called fire from heaven in full view of humanity. The second beast directed all praise to the image of the Antichrist and marked every human captivated by him with the mark of the beast. The second beast was given the title False Prophet. Satan was in a winning position. As more of the elect were deceived into worshipping the beast, his army grew. His unholy trinity was complete and were ready for a three-on-three. Three. The time had finally come to enact Satan's endgame strategy. The unholy trinity opened their mouths, and from each of them came a demonic spirit that looked like a frog. They went out to all people, performing signs and deceiving them into joining the devil's army. 
all the kings of Earth were gathered together, led by the Trinity of Destruction. The place they met was called Armageddon, and there they prepared their forces for the arrival of Satan's ancient opponent. Suddenly, a blast of white light pierced through the heavens. From the clouds came a man on a white horse. He was accompanied by myriads of other riders, descending from heaven's gates and gathering in the sky. The great king of kings had returned to earth. But before initiating battle, a single angel caught the attention of them all. He stood in the sun and called out to the birds of the sky, Come, gather together for the great supper of God. This battle cry sounded across both army formations, igniting the onslaught. The beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies against the white army of heaven. But the battle was swift and decisive. The beast was captured along with the false prophet, and together they were tossed alive into the fiery lake of burning sulphur. As they fell, they watched as the armies of God annihilated every soldier in the devil's ranks. Behind them, an enormous swarm of bloodthirsty birds followed, gorging themselves on the dead men's flesh. Satan was in trouble. In the face of such a defeat, Satan had no choice but to attempt an escape. Instead, he was seized by an angel from heaven and tossed into the abyss. Sealed and locked away by a special key, the devil was left alone with his thoughts. Festering over yet another humiliation at the hands of God. Finally, he was imprisoned, giving mankind a chance to breathe without his relentless hounding. For the next 1,000 years, King Jesus ruled the earth in harmony. Believers who were beheaded for the gospel were resurrected to rule with Christ in his victorious kingdom. While the earth experienced a renewal, Satan sat in silent darkness, contemplating his humiliating defeats. From the very start, God had unfairly overlooked Satan, rewarding humans with the glory he deserved all along. He threw everything he had at Christ in his human form, desperately trying to ruin him. But in the end, he only served to advance God's redemptive plan for humanity, the very last thing he desired. He thought in forming an unholy trinity to oppose the Godhead, he would taste victory at last. But the battle seemed to be over before it even started. In reconciling his many failures, Satan had to make a decision. Would he concede at last, in hope that his arch nemesis would show him mercy? Or would he fight unto death for his unruly cause? Many emotions may have stirred within him in those thousand years, but one rose to the top. One conquered all, and overpowered any skerrick of morality left in his being. With snarling and gnashing of teeth, Satan embodied rage in its purest form. After the thousand years had ended, the abyss was open and Satan charged out of the depths in fury. He stormed the face of the earth, trying his most twisted and cunning tactics to deceive the people one final time. He travelled the four corners of the earth and saw powerful success in gathering the nations together. He gazed over his new army, they numbered like the sand on the seashore. His battle lines stretched across the whole earth, and his army surrounded the camp of God's people in the holy city. The elect were staring down an unwinnable matchup from worldly standards, but they didn't serve a worldly god. Suddenly, the heavens opened and fire poured out onto the armies of Satan. The flames devoured every soul outside of the city. The devil, consumed with rage, was restrained and tossed into the same fiery lake of burning sulphur as his comrades. After the smoke cleared, Satan caught a final glimpse of mankind, glorious in being 
pure and white, welcomed into heaven by their loving Creator. God was right all along. Mankind was worthy to receive the blessing because of Christ's atoning work on the cross. This flawed creation was now made perfect, imaging God without blemish. They were a creation that could only be described as glorious and screaming in the lake of fire. Satan couldn't be further from that glory. Guys, thank you so much for watching this movie. I have poured so much of my heart into this project and I really hope it's helped you draw closer to God in a way that you haven't before. Um, if you're enjoying what's happening on the channel, please consider subscribing and stick around because there's gonna be some really exciting projects coming in the future. If you feel led, you can support us financially on Patreon as well. That would be immensely appreciated. I love you all and God bless.